Hey, good morning, family of grace. Welcome to our online campus. My name is Pastor Chris. If you don't know me, I'm our online campus pastor here at Grace Central Coast. We are a gospel-centered, multi-campus church on the Central Coast of California, and we're all about helping people find and follow Jesus. Uh, I'd love to know that you are here worshiping with us today, uh, especially if you found us new uh, because of Easter or for whatever reason. So could you reach out to me, Chris, at gracecentralcoast.org. I'd love to know I got to worship with you today. And even if you're not new, if you've been here a hundred times, if you want someone to pray with or someone to talk with, um, I'm here with you in for you. I hope you and your family had a great Easter weekend, a weekend of worship where we celebrated and remembered Christ's death and his resurrection. And we're going to continue that this week and every week because here at Grace Central Coast, we're all about helping people find and follow Jesus. So let's do that right now. Let's dive into God's word, see how we've been called to worship him, and let's sing out in response to who he's been. From Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Let's sing out to him now. Let's sing, You Are Able. Circumstance, you are the rock on which I stand. You are the God who always sees us, even in bare and desperate seasons. No matter what the circumstance, you are the rock on which I stand. You are bigger than all my fears, God of love, God my love. You are bigger than all my dreams, God my hope, God my peace. Whatever will come my way Through each day I will say God, I trust you I trust you You are bigger than all my fears God of love, God my love You are bigger than all my dreams God my hope, God my peace Whatever will come my way each day I will say, God, I trust you, I trust you.
The only firm foundation in this world is Jesus Christ. Let's pray and sing this out together. Our hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, healing is all my open stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. song we could ever sing you're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You were the every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. You're holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of 
every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, a name above every other name Jesus, the only one you could ever save You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation And I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken you're holy there is no one like you there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. You're holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and hold Fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me And I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation And I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation And I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken, no. And Lord, I truly believe that if we put our trust in you as our firm foundation, Lord, we will not be shaken. As you are victorious over sin and death here on this earth and beyond, you've invited us into that through your son. We thank you for that. We need that desperately. And so, Lord, we, we accept that gift from you today. And then as we sing out, Lord, we make a commitment to build our life upon that love. It's the firm foundation. We pray these things for your glory in your son's name. Amen. Hey, family of grace. My name is Darren Nelson. I am the college and young adults pastor here at Grace Central Coast. And as we head into a time of giving back today, I want to make you aware of our adoption and foster care ministry. Before we do that, just a quick reminder, there's two ways to give financially at Grace. You can do that physically or digitally. If you want to do it physically, you can mail a check to our church office or you can drop off a check in an offering box at one of our physical campuses or digitally. You can use the Church Center app or go to our website. And if you're new, we're just honored that you're worshiping with us today. Don't feel the need to give right now. 
Well, let's talk about our adoption and foster care ministry. Hopefully you know that this is a ministry here at Grace Central Coast, and we wanna make you aware of something that's coming up in regards to this ministry and what you can do to be a part of how God's using this in our church. So our adoption and foster care ministry is a team that helps care for those in our church body and in the broader community who are bringing these kids in need of help into their homes, either through adopting or through foster care. Right now in our county, there are over 330 kids in foster care and in need of foster care or adoption, but there's only 100 families that are caring for these kids. And to make the problem worse, we've learned that in the course of that first year of bringing kids into their home, only half of the families doing that actually make it through that first year because it's so difficult. And so what we wanna do is come alongside those families who have chosen to bring these kids into their home and we wanna support them. And so we have something called support friends or support teams. This can be something done as an individual or a couple or a family or even a whole growth group. And what a support friend or support team does is comes alongside a family who's engaging in adoptive or foster care and they do things like babysitting for these families, running errands for these families, making meals for these families, really any way that they can come alongside and support and help these families make it past not just a year, but however long these kids need help. And so this is so in line with the heart of Jesus to care for the least of these. And even if you don't feel like this is something you're gonna do in your home right now, we want you to know that you can become a support friend or join a support team and help this ministry. We also want you to be aware of an event that's coming up. So if this excites you, if this speaks to you and you wanna get involved, Sunday, May 1st in Mitchell Park, right across the street from our slow campus, we're having an event with some free pizza and a chance to get to know this ministry more and get deeper involvement for you or your growth group or whoever. So this is for all current foster and adoptive families. This is also for anyone who wants more info about what it would look like to be a support friend or join a support team. So Sunday, May 1st, right after our 1045 service, we're gonna be in Mitchell Park and you can get more info about that event or about this ministry or about becoming a support friend on our church website, gracecentralcoast.org slash adoption and foster care. So let's just pray now for this ministry, thanking God for all that he's already doing and ask him to do even more still in this area as we care for the least of these in our county. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've grown this ministry here at Grace. Thank you for those who have a heart for the least of these, these kids, Lord, that need your love, that need the gospel. Thank you for these families who are stepping out in faith to bring these children into their home. And would you raise up more help, more support friends, people who can come alongside. Lord, this is so in line with your heart for orphans. You talk about this throughout scripture. We want to come alongside and care for these kids. And would you give more people in our church a heart to come alongside, to care for, to support, so that we can see people brought into the family of God, brought into the love of Jesus. Um, Lord, give us energy and enthusiasm for this. We pray for that gathering on May 1st, that that would inform more in our church body and our community about how we can do this together. We also pray for our time this morning as we hear from the word that you would speak over us, that as we come back to Hebrews chapter 11 and now 12, you would help us to rejoice over what you've called us to do and pressing on in our faith um, alongside those throughout history who have looked to Jesus as they've continued the walk of faith. Um, be with us now as we hear from your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, we'll grab a Bible with me and let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 for our scripture reading today. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 39, and I'm going to read through chapter 12, verse 4 for us. So this is Hebrews 11, starting in verse 39, and it says this, And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, welcome today. Maybe you were a guest with us on Easter and you're back with us today. Maybe you're joining us for the first time up in the North County and downtown Slow in the five cities. Maybe you're checking us out for the first time online. Whatever your situation is, we're so glad that you're here. Thank you for worshiping with us at Grace Central Coast. I'm Tim Thule and I'm the lead teaching pastor here. And uh, each week we open the Bible together. We believe that God has spoken and still speaks through the words of this book, the Bible. And so each week we study it together. And I am fired up today. We've been studying the book of Hebrews together and uh, we've come today to the climactic charge of the whole book right here at the beginning of chapter 12. It's been our benediction text for our Hebrew study, the verses that we speak to one another each week as we uh, leave our worship together. Uh, Each week since October, we've been reading these verses and that's been intentional. The whole entire book has been building to this. Remember, this book was written to a community of Jewish Christians in the first century who are experiencing tough stuff, suffering and persecution. Turns out that the Christian life is longer and harder than they expected. And some of them are falling away from Jesus. Some of them are turning away from Jesus and some of them are going back to their old Judaism. The author of Hebrews writes to encourage them to hang in there, to persevere, to endure in their faith in Jesus. He's trying to help them understand that true saving faith is a faith that finishes. The first 10 chapters of the book, remember, are written to prove, let's see if you remember, that Jesus is, let me hear it, Jesus is better. Chapter 11 is Faith's Hall of Fame, a collection of Old Testament stories, men and women who lived and died by enduring faith in the everyday circumstances of their lives. They were all looking forward to one degree or another to God's promise of a Savior. They were all looking forward to Jesus. But look at Hebrews 11, verse 39. It says this, All of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Do you hear what the author is saying? Uh, They didn't have what we have. God has provided something better for us. What is it? It's Jesus in the gospel, our better high priest, our better sacrifice, the mediator of a better covenant. Their faith looked forward to all that we've received in Jesus. That's wild to think about. That's astounding. Now look at chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he's talking about all those that he's mentioned in in chapter 11 and so many more. This is the great cloud of witnesses. Now it's our turn. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Now here it is, the, the centerpiece and the central command of this text. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Did you catch it? When the author comes to his climactic charge of his whole book, he resorts, he turns to a metaphor, a powerful and pregnant word picture to encourage us to enduring faith. He pictures the Christian life as a race, a race of faith. And so here's what I want us to see in this text together today. First, the fact of our race of faith. Second, the focus of our race of faith. And finally, a whole bunch of encouragement for our race of faith. Let's start with the fact of our race of faith. Do you ever stop and ask, what is life all about? I sure do. This world is crazy and confusing and so broken. What is God doing in this world and what is my place in it? What does God expect from me? 
Do you see the charge and word picture in Hebrews 12 is telling us what life is about for the Christian. The Christian life is a race of faith. Now, the author here only calls it a race, but we know that he is talking about a race of faith because faith was the great theme of chapter 11. By faith is the rep repeated refrain throughout chapter 11. By faith, this person did this. By faith, that person did that. Not only that, but Jesus here is called, just a phrase later, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Do you remember Hebrews 11, verse 6? And without faith, it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith is what pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And, and so what God wants more than anything else is for you and I to trust him. And for us, that means trusting Jesus. This is what God wants more than anything else in our lives. For us to trust him in every circumstance of life. No matter what happens in life, come hell or high water, in blessing and sorrow and suffering, when life is going good and when life sucks, when we can see God's purposes and when, and when we have no idea where God is or what God's doing. Finally, when our strength wanes and the light of our eye dims, when we grow old and we breathe our last breath, God still wants the same thing, for us to trust him. Boil it all down, strip it all back. This is what life is about. This is how God sees it. And this is how God wants us to see it. This is what God is doing in our lives. He's testing our faith to grow our faith. Everything that happens in our life, everything that God allows in our lives, is intended for this purpose, to teach us to trust him. This is our race of faith. Your education, your work life, your family life, your marriage and your parenting, your friendships, the money that you earn and how you spend it, your time and what you do with that time, your gifts, your skills, your experience, all of this and everything you do in life, every part of your life is part of your race of faith if you're a Christian. And this is true if you're 5, if you're 25, if you're 55, or you're 85, if you're a Christian and you're still alive, you're still in the race of faith. This charge is a charge for you. Now, stop and think for a second. Is this the way that you think about your life? Is this the way that you understand your life? Do you see your life as a race of faith? What if you did? Wouldn't that simplify things a bit for you? Wouldn't it provide a clarity when you lose your way, when things get fuzzy and crazy and confusing in life? Wouldn't this word picture provide for you a reliable comp a compass, a north star? I don't know when I first memorized these verses. It was a long, long time ago. But as I was thinking about the, these verses this week in preparation for today's message, I realized that that's what this word picture has been for me. It's been for me a compass and a north star, a God-given framework to help me understand my life. And so the great charge here is, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Don't stop, don't walk, run. And keep running this race of faith all the way to the end. What's the end? The, the finish line, your last breath of this earthly life. So are you running by faith today? Are you running? Are you running by faith? Well, that is the fact of our race of faith. What comes next in the text? What comes next in the test, text is the focus of our race of faith. Look at the text again. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here it is. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. As we run this race of faith in our everyday circumstances of our lives, did you catch it? 
This race of faith involves looking to Jesus. Our eyes are to be fixed on Jesus, not on our surroundings, not on our circumstances, not on our own strategy or strength or stamina, not on those who are around us. No, our eyes were to be looking to Jesus. We're to be focused on him. I've told you about my son Zeke's dog, Luther. Some of you uh, are new in our church and you, you weren't here for the beginning of our Hebrew series, but my, my son Zeke has this dog, Luther, and L Luther is absolutely obsessed with his Frisbee. I just grabbed it today. It's kind of nasty. It's all dirty, but every single day, Luther wants us to throw the Frisbee. In the morning when he wakes up, he expects the thris fris Frisbee to be thrown. Every time we come home, he meets us at the car and he's agitated. It happened just this week. My wife said, what is wrong with him? I said, he wants it. He's expecting someone to throw him the Frisbee. When somebody throws the Frisbee, Luther runs to catch it. And as he runs to catch his Frisbee, his eyes are absolutely, totally, only fixed, focused on that Frisbee. That's the picture here. Jesus is to be our Frisbee. Our, our, our eyes and our hearts are to be locked on him. Why is that? Well, first, because Jesus is the object of our faith. He is who we're running toward. Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Jesus is the one who loves us and gave his life for us. Jesus is our forgiveness and our eternal life is found only in him. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. Jesus is the living word of God. Jesus is the beloved son of God. Jesus is our hope and the true satisfaction of our souls, what our souls long for. Jesus is the fairest of 10,000s. Jesus is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the bright and morning star. Jesus, his name is above all names. Jesus is the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. In our race of faith, Jesus is the finish line. And when we reach him, we will see him. And when we see him, we will be changed and we will be like him. We look to Jesus as we run our race of faith. Because he's the object of our faith. He is who our faith is in. But there's even more here. Jesus is the object of our faith. And Jesus is the power of our faith. Because he ran for us. And he's running with us. Have you ever thought about why Jesus lived 33 years on the earth? Why didn't Jesus just show up at 33 years old to die for our sins? Just boop, show up. Jesus didn't just show up because Jesus didn't just come to die for us. Jesus also came to live for us. Jesus came to live a righteous life of faith, the life that God desires and requires. Jesus came to live life for us. He lives in our place, and that's what qualifies him to die in our place. At the cross, he not only forgives our sins, as all our sins are laid on him, he also gives us his righteousness, all his perfect faith-filled obedience. It's the great gospel exchange. Jesus not only erases our billions of dollars of debt, he also deposits billions of dollars of cash into our bank accounts. That cash is his life of faith his perfect obedience, his righteousness. Jesus ran this race of faith for us. That's what the author of Hebrews means when he calls Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. The word founder means author, pioneer, the first, the pathfinder, the, the trailblazer. The word translated perfecter, it means finisher. Jesus not only starts the race for us, he finishes the race for us. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the victorious champion of this race of faith. 
Jesus has run this race of faith before us. He's finished and he's won. And it's like now he's circled back from the finish line to come and meet us wherever we're at in our race of faith to help us finish our race of faith with us. He's pacing us, so to speak. And he's saying, watch me. Don't take your eyes off me. I've already won the victory for you, so let's finish your race of faith. Jesus has run for us. And now Jesus is running with us. And so we look to him. And there's even more. Not only is Jesus the object of our faith and the power of our faith, Jesus is the example of our faith. He ran before us. Look what he says. Look what it says. Uh, look what the author says in, in verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. We're not only look to look to Jesus as we run our race of faith, we're to consider or think about Jesus and his race of faith because his race of faith is meant to teach us about our race of faith. His endurance for us is meant to fuel our endurance for him. The author of Hebrews wants us to run this race eyes wide open and eyes on Jesus. Stop again. Where are you looking today as you run your race of faith today? Are you looking down at your own slow, sore feet? Are you looking around at your circumstances and all that overwhelms you? Are you looking to all those running around you and wondering about their race of faith? Or are you looking to Jesus? We run this race of faith by looking to Jesus. Fix your eyes, lock your eyes on him. And so we're seeing here in Hebrews 12, the fact of our race of faith and the focus of our race of faith. And the rest of what's here, everything that surrounds the central charge here, I really see it as a whole bunch of encouragement for our race of faith. Think of the author of Hebrews like a coach. He's our running coach. He's prepping us for the big race. He's telling us what to expect. He's telling us about the race course. It's as if, as if he's giving us a pre-race pep talk. And I notice five encouragements here. And I just want to show them to you. I want to walk us through them. Here's the first. Run with endurance because the race is long and hard. Did you notice in these verses how many times the author mentions endurance? Verse 1, let us run with endurance the race that is set before, before us. Verse 2, Jesus endured the cross. Verse 3, Jesus endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Consider him so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. The author is straight up about this race. The race of faith is a long, grueling marathon, not a quick sprint. Endurance is required. We've got to settle into this thing and we've got to stick it out. Weariness and losing heart, these are real threats. Stopping, giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel, abandoning the race. He's telling us that we're going to want to quit. There's going to be times where we're going to want to quit. And some of the Hebrews to whom this book was written, the Jewish Christians, they were quitting. Sadly, I've seen so many people quit the race of faith, and I bet you have too. Friends who started running the race of faith in Jesus strong. But now, for all sorts of different reasons, they've abandoned the race altogether. The author is saying, don't quit. Jesus didn't quit. For the joy set before him, that's us. He endured. He finished. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, if we know that the race is long and hard, we too can endure and finish also. That's encouragement number one. Here's encouragement number two. Remember that others have run the race before us. 
That's, this is really the connection between chapter 11 and the charge here in chapter 12. Did you see it? Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The picture here is of a stadium filled with those who have already run the race of faith before us. All those mentioned in Hebrews 11 and many, many more. And now they're watching us run our race of faith and they're cheering us on. Think of that. All these people we met in chapter 11, Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the faithful remnant of Israel, Joshua, Rahab, and all the rest, they're watching you run your race of faith, and they're cheering you on. You can do it. Don't quit. Hang in there. It's so worth it. There's joy coming. Keep running. This week, as you run what feels like to you your lonely, long, and grueling race of faith, remember the great cloud of witnesses. You're not the only one running this race. So many others have run before you. Jesus has run before you, and this cloud of witnesses, and so many others are running with you too. Others here at Grace Central Coast, others around the world. Think about this, Christians in Ukraine. They're running their race of faith. In Russia, there are Christians running a race of faith. In deep China, in sub-Saharan Africa, around the world in so many other places, there are Christians running their race of faith. We don't run alone. So many are running. Here's encouragement number three. Look for and lay aside weight that slows us down. Did you see it in verse one? Let us also lay aside every weight. Now, I wouldn't call myself a runner, and I don't really like to run, but I do run. I run four-ish miles two to three times a week. I run enough to know that I would never run in jeans or a heavy flannel. Too heavy, too uncomfortable. When I run, I wear the lightest, most comfortable clothes that I can find. Running is so much easier when you run light. There's so much in our lives that can weigh us down and slow us down as we run our race of faith. These things aren't always bad things, but they can be distracting, unprofitable things, things that aren't helpful. Sure, I can binge watch Disney Plus every weekend, but I'm pretty sure that's not gonna help me run my race of faith come the next Monday through Friday. Sure, I can play Xbox shooter games hours a day, but is that gonna help me run my race of faith? Paul says in Corinthians, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. There's a whole bunch of stuff in our lives that isn't necessarily unlawful. It's not bad in and of itself, but it's just not helpful. It just doesn't help us. It's weighing us down as we run our races of faith. So what in your life is weighing you down? What is slowing you down as you try to run your race of faith. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's an unhealthy relationship. Maybe it's something that's taking up too much of your time or too much of your energy or too much of your headspace or too much of your heart space. You and I will run lighter, longer, and stronger this race of faith if we look for those things and lay them aside. You gotta look for them. You got to think about what is weighing me down. What is slowing me down? I love this charge. Fourth encouragement is similar to the third. Look for and lay aside sin that trips us up. It's right there. It's paired with the weight, right? Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Often when I run, I take Luther, the dog, running with me because that crazy dog has so much energy and I'm trying to wear him out. But when I run with Luther, I run with Luther on a leash, which means I have to really pay attention because if I'm not careful, Luther and that leash are going to trip me up. I'm going to stumble and I'm going to fall and it's happened. The author here pictures sin like Luther's leash, or if you like this better, like an untied shoelace. Sin clings 
to us. It wraps us up and entangles us and it trips us up. It makes us stumble and fall. Running the race of faith involves looking for sin, rooting it out of our lives and then laying it aside. How do we do that? It means owning, confessing, repenting of those sins to the Lord and to one another. This is a lifelong process because we never stop sinning. And sin, sin clings so closely. And so what are the subtle sins that are clinging closely and tripping you up in your race of faith today? Your sin today might be fear or pride, an addiction, a good thing that's become or becoming an ultimate thing in your life. It might be stealing or lying or defensiveness. It might be negativity or lack of joy. It might be some secret thing in your life that no one knows about, but you know it. You have to look for these things in your life. And as we see them, we need to lay them aside if we're going to run the race of faith with endurance, if we're going to finish the race of faith. If we don't, they really can trip us up, injure us, and take us out of the race. Fifth and final encouragement for our race of faith, it was a new insight for me in this text one that I don't think that I'd seen before. I don't know why I'd never seen it, because it's right here in verse 1. Look at it with me again. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance. Here's what grabbed me. The race that is set before us. Here it is. Remember, God has set out our race before us, your race and my race. One of the things that I love about Hebrews 11 is that every story and life circumstance across the chapter is different. These lived by faith, all these men and women, in the circumstances of their everyday lives, but all those circumstances were different. Every person's race of faith is different. One size doesn't fit all. But what Hebrews 12 verse 1 is telling us is that our sovereign good God has laid out a specific race for each one of us. And what that means is that your race isn't random, it isn't haphazard, it isn't some cruel joke, the circumstances that you're dealing with today. Wherever you are, the circumstances in which you find yourself, that is where God has placed you. And he's working through your upbringing, and your choices, he's worked through all of that to put you right where you are today. We don't know why God has placed us where we are, but the Bible teaches us that he has. And where you are is where God wants you to run your race of faith. The race that you're in is the race that God has for you. What is this life about? The Bible teaches it's this simple for the Christian. Let us run this race of faith with endurance, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Let's do that. Let's look to Jesus right now together. Our Lord God, we're so grateful for uh, your word, its teaching, and its guidance. We, we're so grateful for Jesus, and we look to him today. We fix our eyes. We lock our eyes and our hearts, our lives on him today. We once more make Jesus our Frisbee. Would you give us grace to understand life, to think about our lives even this week as we leave this place with this framework, this understanding that what you want in our lives, what you want from, from your people more than anything else is that we would trust you, that we would live lives of faith, that we would run the race of faith that you have set out for each one of us, that we'd run our race of faith, uh, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You know what each circumstance looks like. You've set it out. Would you meet each one today, my brothers and sisters here at Grace Central Coast? Would you encourage their hearts with these encouragements? Would you spur them on? I want to spur them on to love and good deeds and to run harder, run longer, run with endurance this race of faith. 
We thank you that this is what life is about. And you're so clear in telling us that. Help us run with endurance this week with our eyes fixed on Jesus. It's in his name that we ask and pray and now worship you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. Yeah, I've also been waiting eagerly for that passage to be taught. So uh, we're going to read that uh, with and to each other before we go out in just a minute, um, like we normally do, but maybe in a new way today, um, because we now uh, understand it greater. But before that, we have a next step, um, something to take into your week, take into your growth group, something to take away and take action um, from what we've learned today. This is our next step today. As you run your race of faith this week, take some time to pause and ponder, where are you looking? How are you running? What is weighing you down and or tripping you up? I encourage you. Yeah, this is a way where we can take God's word in and we can learn it and we can know it and then we can do it. We can act um, practically. We can live a life. This is a way that we run our race. So um, I encourage you to take this next step with yourself, with your family, with your growth group uh, today. With that, why don't you stand wherever we're at? And like I said, we're going to read this passage maybe in a new way together today. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Have a great week, church. Hi kids, my name is Cherie, and I'm the Family Care Coordinator on the Five Cities campus at Grace Central Coast. Today we're going to sing some songs, listen to a Bible story, and hear some questions from kids. Let's get started. Hey kids, welcome to Sing Along Songs. This is the part of the show where you sing along while we sing a song. And for today's song, we're going to actually teach you how to play the song. So grab any keyed instrument like this here, guitar or a piano or something that looks like this. And you're just going to play this key, the G key, a lot of times. And then you're going to play the C key, a lot of times. And then you're going to play the D key, a lot of times. And that's it. If you can play those three keys, you can play this song. All right? Here we go. One, two, three, four. Every single week we get days at number seven, but only one day is the closest to heaven. Not talking about Saturday and Friday's overrated. The best day of the week is the most understated. It's a Tuesday. Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. The best day ever. The week has just begun and I'm getting in a group. Who wants to make the end? I'm in a midweek mood. Sundays are great and Thursdays are fine. But you're passing right over the day that's sublime. It's a Tuesday. Tuesday. <coughs> it's a Tuesday. Well, yes it is. Let me list all the ways that Tuesdays are best. So much more goodness than all of the rest. It's a work day, a school day, a day to pay bills. To utilize efficiently your educated skills. It's a Tuesday. A Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. Woo, the best day ever. Not a Wednesday. I mean, no, no, it's not. Not a Tuesday. Yeah, a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. God had led the Israelites out of Egypt, and he was with them as Joshua led them into the promised land of Canaan. There, the Israelites lived in family tribes, 12 tribes in all. And God made a covenant with them, saying, I will keep my promises, but this is what you must agree to. Never make a covenant with the people living in this land. Tear down their altars to their false gods. The Israelites had agreed, and they were supposed to take over the land, but that's not what happened. After Joshua and the older generation of Israelites died, the Israelite children grew up and did not remember God or everything he had done for them. They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The Israelites fell into this, this cycle of sin, and it went like this. First, the Israelites would disobey God and worship the false gods of the people living around them. They'd forget about the one true God. 
God would, would grow angry and he would, he would let an enemy king come in and take over the Israelites. And the people would have to serve that king. And they would suffer greatly. Then the Israelites would remember how good they had it when they loved and obeyed God. They would cry out to him, save us. God wanted the people to love and obey him. So he would raise up a leader from the Israelites to deliver them from their enemies and rule as a judge. The people would obey God as long as the judge was alive. But when the judges died, the Israelites would turn away from God and the cycle would begin again. Sin, oppression, repentance, rescue, obedience, and then all the way back to sin again. This is the story of the book of Judges. The judges saved the people from the consequences of their sin, but not the cause of it. God's plan was to one day send a true deliverer, Jesus, his own son, to be the king of his people. Jesus saves people from sin forever. Hi there, I'm Pastor Kevin. It's time for questions from kids. John from Canton, Ohio asks, if God changes our hearts when we trust in Jesus, why do Christians still sin? That is a really good question. And it's great that you're beginning to understand that God does change our hearts when we come to know Jesus Christ. Well, we sin because we live in a fallen world. And when we trace back through the Old Testament, we see that the fallenness that happened in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve has had an effect on the world. And it still impacts us today. Now, we still sin because we live in a fallen world. Even when we become Christians and we put all of our trust in God, Satan still tempts us. We see Satan even tempting Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4 comes down and he is tempting uh, Jesus Christ to do many things and Jesus Christ rejects him. Jesus Christ deals with Satan's temptations by responding with the word of God. So Satan still tempts us even as Christians. And then the world still tempts us to do things that are wrong even though we are Christians. You may see things television, you may see things that your friends do, you may see things uh, when you're traveling outside or even playing outside and your heart may be tempted to do wrong things. So Satan still tempts us, the world still tempts us, and then our flesh is weak. Our own desires still tempt us to do wrong things. The scripture tells us the world, Satan, and our flesh calls us to want to do things that are not in obedience with what God's word tells us to do. You see, Paul in Romans chapter 7 dealt with this very thing. Paul, the Paul who wrote 13 books in the Bible, said, when I want to do the right thing, evil is all around me. Paul says, even when I know the right thing to do, my desires still want to do the wrong thing. So you are not alone in working through the idea that I am saved now, or Jesus Christ loves me now, or I belong to him, and I still have a desire I want to do the wrong things. All Christians, whether young or old, deal with daily battles of doing what Jesus Christ tells us to do, which is to put to death the deeds of the body. He tells us we need to carry our cross daily and to fight sin daily. So defeating sin is a daily battle that a Christian grows to deal with by the power of the Spirit. And whether young or old, you will always have to deal with putting to death the deeds of the body. Remember, any sin that you or I can commit, any sin that any man or woman can commit, Christ's blood is sufficient and it is enough to cover all of those sins. And since we love Christ and when we come to know him, we want to sin less. We want to put to death the deeds of the body. We want to be better. We want to do better. Christ wants us to be more like him. 
What are some ways we can know we're becoming more like Jesus? That's it for our show today, kids. As usual, we're going to close things out by singing Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. How should we sing it today, Josh? Well, Nick, I was thinking, I've got the hat, so let's do it cowboy style. Cowboy, country cowboy style. Yeah. Nice and low, nice and low and gravelly. Let's do it on three. Ready? One, two, three. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Bit more of a creed vibe, but still good. See you guys next time. We're so glad you joined us today. We are committed to helping your kids find and follow Jesus. For further resources, please go to gracecentralcoast.org. See you next time.